we've got basically two objectives in this particular session. The first is open discussion, see if there's any other items, anything else that needs to be discussed. Uh, I will attempt to keep the discussions focused and to the point. Um, then what we want to do is take a look at some recommendations. I've got a draft list. We can delete, we can add, we can modify however we want when we get to that part of the uh, discussion. Um, and the reason for having that list is to see if we can tease out some action items that uh, we can go away from this meeting with uh, that we can hopefully report on next year and next year's meeting. But I guess I'm getting ahead of myself talking about next year's meeting. Okay. Um, so that's basically the objectives, uh, outcomes, as hopefully will be a, a list of action items. And so let's get started. Um, so we're in the open session. Uh, topics that have not been discussed yet, issues you want to get on the floor. Um, who wants to start it off? Is there anything that hasn't been addressed? Coming up with no hands. I find that a little hard to believe. Ah, Jeff Domago. He's going to come up and talk to us about Kathy, I bet. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to bring up a point that Becky asked me about in the hallway. It wasn't in a dark alley. It was actually a well-lit hallway. Um, in terms of the, there has been work in Central Region, Jeff and John Ice, uh, worked on a product list for the HREF. This is the HREF that we, this time lag ensemble that we put together when we did the high-res window upgrade. So the question Becky had is, can we use that product list for the, the MRR and for the future HREF that would have hourly updates? And so the question is, can we propagate that list as a more uniform set of output for convection allowing Guidance. Steve, had, Steve, you at SPC had put together a list, and I think the, the HREF list includes all of yours. Have you looked for that? Okay, so I, what I told her is I said, let's, what I'll do is we'll, we'll do the comparison and try to get back to her fairly quickly. And okay, then, if you can send something out to whatever list of folks you think would be appropriate, then we can take a look and hopefully by sometime in January come to some conclusion. Is that too late, given the holidays well, coming up? Probably not too late, but if we can get it done before the end of January, that would be good. I, I thought you were in that loop. We had, a year ago, we had proposed and then went ahead with coming up with a common grid list for convection-allowing models such that at the next upgrade of each model, there would be this set approximately 100 uh, parameter list that all convection aligned models, if possible, uh, they would have that so it wouldn't be this vast change from model to model. Right. We were able to get some agreement on that. We actually used, uh, for starters, what the regions had developed uh, the previous year for the HER as the starting point for that right. so that we would have some consistency and uniformity across the modeling suite for convection allowing. And it certainly would be a good starting point to use that for the HREF. Right. Well, again, there's been an effort in Central Region to gather the requirements for this list. So, oh, yeah, now I read. That's right. That's right. We so, gave you comments that were somewhat different than what was on the choices that we felt that both for high-resolution models and a high-resolution ensemble, there were certain things that we found, at least for convection, to be extremely helpful. So they have our input. Okay. So well, I'm just going to lay it out there. Maybe one of the action items we can put on the list is we're going to we'll get together and do one final iteration or two to get a a list that can be used um, more across the board. Uh, John is texting me. I, I had him send the the list that it was. It went out of back in October or November, but um, we'll uh, send it to Mary Hart. Okay. Okay. Yes, sounds good. And and you all can tell Becky that I did what she asked me to do. So 
she won't accost me in a dark alley sometime down the road. You're safe, Jeff. <clears throat> yes, we'll involve GST. All right, it, another topic. Anybody? Jeff, you're holding the mic. You got something to say? Old habits Okay, we're going to stand here. Uh, I guess I wanted to bring up this topic here. It's been batted around a little bit over the last several months about. I guess aerosol and smoke and uh, as a component to, I guess, visibility, cloud issues here and uh, about, uh, you know, we, I think many of you know that we've uh, been taking some steps here toward doing such an integration uh, for the short range forecasting and, uh, and have not at this point brought in, uh, you know, the MODIS fire data to initialize, help initializing aerosols that are sort of actually in her V2 and RAF V3. But we're in a position to do that, and we think that's sort of a good integration uh, direction to go in here. Uh, so, you know, different uh, user communities can be served together, but there's definitely big overlap here with region needs as, as much as we are aware of that. We think that can be done at uh, low cost. Eventually there's a, you know, if we want to do more involved chemistry, there, there's a higher cost for that. But I just thought I would bring up that topic for discussion. Okay, comments? I had the pleasure of being at the CSD review also where a lot of the chemical stuff was discussed. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's adding these chemical packages to the weather packages is not trivial, is not cheap. Per uh, Andrik, it depends on what version of chemistry uh, you want. And what I'm suggesting here is it's possible to do something that's pretty simple, a two aerosol uh, scheme, and just to populate that with data a little bit. And uh, there are other aspects. I think there will be trade-offs in the future for us to consider. You know, maybe that's more in the five-year-plus kind of range here. But there's a, there's an entry level that we can do something for smoke, fire visibility, help our cloud formation with the cloud condensation. Right. And, and some of, some of that stuff already is available in loose products for different scales here. And and one of the parts that we really need to discuss earlier rather than later is how how we want to unify that because I don't want to see. I do want to see us do these products everywhere. I don't want to see completely different approaches at a different scale. So Let me suggest here that it's possible to have a physically consistent solution here within a HER framework that I'm throwing out for us to consider with, with no relatively, actually basically no cost here. So, no, and, and we do have an air quality uh, uh, team in NGGPS, and that will be a, a good place to discuss that in. This is a near-term possibility. Yeah, but we're already running stuff too, so that is a, a, a past-term possibility. So. Yeah, the answer is yes. And that's why I'm bringing it up. I hope it's a good topic to bring up, Hendrik. Any other further comments on that or user opinions? <laughs> Yeah, Ben Schwedler from AWC. Um, I definitely think that um, one of the things that is an issue with both cloud and visibility right now is that based on whatever post-processing techniques are used, you may or may not have you don't have all the physical processes that would be contributing to those hazards. Um, if you use just a purely extinction-based or you don't bring in uh, precipitation or aerosols into a cloud-based or visibility sort of thing, that's, that's an issue from our perspective is that 
Um, right now, it, it's not all the processes that are currently being represented in parameterizations make that into that final product. So um, if there are things that can be done uh, in the short term, that would be quite valuable to us. Further comments? Does this impact anybody else? Okay, different topic. Something else that you've been itching to get out into discussion. Mike. I didn't want to relaunch our probabilistic discussion from before because it did take up about a half hour, but I did want to ask a specific question to Jeff Domego who had brought up one of the initial points. Uh, my interpretation of one of your original points was that without a bit more specific um, guidance, pl a plan, product uh, requirements, et cetera, as to how ensembles would be used to meet our probabilistic mission or whatever it might be, that left you with a bit of an unknown as to what the requirements were you were supposed to do with ensembles. Did I essentially get that right? Yeah, yeah. And in, in my point was it in that discussion was it makes it hard to define a requirement if there isn't a, a, a solid vision as to how the ensembles would be used in the forecast process. Which circles me back to your slides from day one, Ken. Where I think you were advocating for a bit of a not a bit a, a a bit more mature plan as to what the new forecast process would be, what the roles and responsibilities of the centers, the WFOs, would be. There, and I tend to agree with you. So we were talking about as far as in our discussion what we want to see out of this. Uh, I I my opinion is is that from a broader perspective, I we've seen the weather radiation roadmap. We've you know, we've, we've seen a lot of discussions about how we can social science to be infused and more. We heard a lot of talk about IDSS, but I haven't seen anything yet that was a vision. And I've seen vision documents in DOD and other places, but a, a real a true vision as to this is how we're going to change the way we do our, our jobs over the next five years. Uh, we had that with the modernization. That was a technological modernization. We even did that to a smaller extent when we went several years ago from traditional forecast products to gridded. Uh, but at some point, there was a, a vision as to what specifically we were going to change. And then we, we were able to go build requirements and build things to meet that vision. I think that's what's missing. Uh, it's not something for EMC or NSEP to, to decide, but it's really something more from corporate national weather service that I think is that next layer of of uh, specificity from, we've heard a lot of talk about a lot of different things of like social science and IDSS, et cetera, but I really, we can press anybody to do anything. I would like to press the OAA office to, what's their vision for how we're going to do our business in five years from now? Because I think without that, you're, you're left, Jeff, with being that proverbial building your half of the bridge, thinking you know where it's going to be meeting in the middle. and. You're, we really can't do anything else because you can't sit on your hands and wait till the the, 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 the complete plans of that bridge are drafted because that could be five years from now. So anyway, that may launch a little longer discussion. That's, that's what I want to talk about. Jeff, yeah. Jeff before, before you chime in, the, since, since he made reference to my slide, I guess I'll take the moderator privileges here and just say that the... I see, as I stated the other day, I, I see we're coming to a point where we're going to change, we're going to have to change the forecast process again. I don't want to dwell so much on the process, it's what the people are doing, what the forecasters are doing. Now, you're right, that's not an EMC or even an NSEP issue per se, um, but it will affect whatever the decision is on how our forecasters operate in the future, that will affect the mission, I think, of uh, EMC and NSEP. And so they, as well as most everybody else in the Weather Service, I think, needs to be at the table when that discussion takes.
takes place. So as Ming said earlier this morning, there's the science component in here. There may be some things we can do, can't do. So maybe we'll have to temper that process a little bit. But um, it isn't so much the process is how knowing, as Jeff said, knowing what people are expected to do so that in turn we can ask these folks to, to provide them with requirements, I guess, what's being asked so that, uh, so that they can kind of serve those needs. Jeff Craven. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate what you said, Mike, uh, about having a higher level vision. Now, in, in the short time I've been at this level, when, when I ponder those kind of questions, what I get is the high level vision is vague to a point in that we, at the mid mid or lower levels have to often fill out what that might look like. So I, I would be afraid that we would be, we will continue to wait um, for quite a bit of time if we want a very specific execution strategy to come at that level. Um, I, in fact, I, in some hallway discussions and just observing, I, I kind of feel like groups like this actually have to bring to them, OK, we heard your vision, and this is this is the straw man outline of how we might execute it. But um, in talking about Peruca, when you say probabilities, there's, there's four or five different ways and frameworks we can do. We can have a, a system based on threshold of exceedance, a, a full probability spectrum, uh, and, and in many other ways that the statisticians could tell me how they could do it. I know I'm biased towards a first guess is that we've been doing things that they, you've seen with the SREF on the SPC side is a thresh. What's the probability of three inches of rain falling in this? So, so I'm, I'm biased, but I don't think that top-down thing will come with enough detail if groups like us don't so the question that I would have is, do we formalize that, or is that organic? Do we have meetings like this where we actually try to put together and brainstorm? Maybe that's something that we do in the STI meeting the next two days. Is really We keep talking about probabilities, but may, we, I think it's, we're on the cusp where we have to make a short-term decision. This is, we're going to try this. And maybe this won't be what happens in 10 years, but, but I don't think it's ever going to come from the office of the AA, personally. Okay. Just, just to add to this, just to add to this a little bit. You can, you can go a step further back, because I thought the question was even asked, uh, uh, what is really the requirement for doing ensembles to begin with? And um, like I said somewhere earlier this week, uh, my, my first assessment of ensembles was lies, dim lies, statistics, ensembles. Uh, I'm completely off that, especially with, um, with both um, um, Sandy and with, uh, with Joaquin. Uh, if you if you look at how the forecast for Joachim went through, um, we got actually very little flack uh, from the fact that our uh, deterministic guidance wasn't that good. And the reason why we didn't get the flack was because we actually had every or every morning, early morning, a meeting to assure that the messaging from the weather service was consistent, and that we consistently messaged that the models told us that it was not clear what the forecast was going to be. And um, having those two, the, the, the two situations with, uh, with Joaquin and with Sandy even more with the really bifurcating two different solutions. Uh, the thing that as a modeler I don't want to ask, but uh, a lot of modelers are scared for asking, do we really have to focus on getting that one deterministic model better or was the value in the uncertainty that show, was shown in the in the ensemble bigger. So my personal head on, I've, I've 
completely changed. I, I do believe that the the whole uh, that the drive forward has to be uncertainty ensemble based just as well as as doing the individual models better. So that's point one. So then point two. <coughs> who uh, who uh, how do I do this? Uh, I I realize that no matter how many ensembles of stuff you have, the real big issue is how to communicate this, how to put it in the forecast. Well, now I'm putting my EMC head on. I can't wait for that. I need to I need to start building building the underlying tools for doing probabilistic forecasting now, and I need to make sure that I plan for doing that systematically all the way through. So my I, my my vision is to build all our systems into ensemble systems. If there's anything wrong with that view from <laughs> the forecasters, I don't mean the view that I don't know how to how to how to get that to the public yet, but if there's any thought about that being a wrong way to build a guidance foundation that you can work off, I need to know that for, uh, faster than slower, but I'm not going to wait until uh, we figure out how to build the whole solution before starting to do it. And then the third thing, <coughs> going back to, <coughs> to the governance of it, um, why did Bill organize the UMAC? Because we've been pushing up and up and up the chain, all the way to SpinRed, to please get a modeling strategy in place for all of NOAA. That, that remained a vacuum that was pushed back to us to solve the problem. How long have we been asking for the weather service to solve the issue of, forget about the word requirement, about a master plan of how to do modeling, which of course has to be requirement-based. I am not going to wait any longer. This is a good group to fill the vacuum if the vacuum is not filled from up top. So I, I, I do feel that we need to, go, as, as part of the discussion before lunch, uh, the same suggestion that, uh, that Stan had uh, is something that was already on my to-do list with, uh, with starting a few documents. I am committed to start moving that ball forward if the vacuum remains. In the meantime, I try to not stand on Andy Stern and other people's toes, but we, we need to start that process to, to start creating a modeling plan requirements path on, on, on our level. And if anybody dis, doesn't agree with that, in, in general, don't talk about the details. I would like to hear that, hear that sooner rather than later too. So, and all these three all go back to that same question about, okay, how, how do you deal with the ensembles? <laughs> uh, and uh, all the other questions fit in there too. Uh, how Mike and I separate the work uh, together with Tom Hamill and others in Israel. And there's, <laughs> there's a lot more, more questions, but have to do ensembles. I'm sure about that. We have to drive the boat on, on getting a organized plan going. And, and with our incredibly improved interactions with OER over the last few years, we have the tools. We can do it. And together we can do it way, way better than we can do it as individual organizations. So anyhow, try to not to ramble too far further. Brad, I think Brad had a... I think I'm next. Okay. Because uh, I want to follow up on what Jeff said and what Hendrick said. Um, you know, Jeff was talking about the base science, you know, of how we do the probabilities is still, you know, something we need to be looking at. Uh, you know, I, I agree with that, and that's one of the things I think that, that FACET is working on with the social scientists is, how you take that probabilistic information, what probabilistic information you need and what format, you know, whether you're looking at exceedances or, you know, what specific type of probability and then get that to a customer base. But I, I want to stress that I think the, the requirement, and this goes to what Hendrick was saying, for probabilistic information and ensemble data, I think that is clear. I mean, I think there are a number of, you know, Weather Ready Nation documents, NIST studies after the Joplin tornado, and numerous uh, reports that indicate that probabilistic information is the way we should be going. And I guess what I wanted to 
build on on what Jeff said is not only do we need to be looking at the the basic science of how to do the probabilities, then I think we have to take it to the next step of how does the human forecaster interact with that guidance? And that's uh, it's not necessarily an issue for EMC, but uh, you know, speaking as somebody who's in the weather service for 25 years and was an MIC for 13 years, I wouldn't want to see forecasters be given a bunch of probabilistic information and think, okay, well, I'm supposed to do with this what I was supposed to do with grid and generating NDFD. I think we have to do a lot of work on what is the role of the human forecaster in interacting with this data before it gets to the external customers. And I, I know at uh, the HWT at NSSL, Chris Carstens, the project he's been doing, he's been doing work in the in the very near term and more of the warning environment on, you know, how much role should the human forecaster have in generating zero to one hour uh, probabilistic hazard information versus how much should be automated guidance. And obviously there's probably a balance in there, but I think we need to be looking at that for the whole spectrum from, you know, the next 15 minutes to eight days out. Where Where is the role of the human forecaster? Where is the role of the National Center? Where is the role of the WFO in, in all of those stages? Yeah, I'm going to ask something not related to ensembles. I'm afraid to ask this question, uh, but it's a follow-up on, some of you may remember Stephen Jaskort, who used to be with the organization, and we had asked Stephen to find out from the FOs, how do you calculate cloud base? And I seem to recall back then it was from the field, and it was still RH-based. Is that still the case? Because our more advanced models are able to provide cloud-based information, the, the phase of the cloud, and the mode. Because when it comes to convection, you can't use RH-based criteria because it's based upon instability. So i kind of like to know before I leave this meeting, where are we in the cloud realm? Because as I look at it, the clouds have kind of fallen through the cracks in the overall hydrologic cycle within the organization. I'm talking about the weather service. And then, uh, go ahead, Jeff. No, I want to hear from you. Uh, I know what they do. Okay. I know what they do. I just okay, Jeff Craven first. Well, um, I guess it depends on the office. Um, I, I, know, I know that the, we're trying really, in fact, on Monday, a tech note went out for 38 WFOs in Central Region that have, they have, they're required to, since we're talking about requirement, they're required to install by January 22nd. <laughs> A, a way to, with, uh, and we call them blends. I used to call them consensus, but it's, I guess, blend is the, there's about seven different sources of cloud height and visibility from short-term models. And some of it's G-LAMP, cloud height and visibility. Some of it is the, you know, the HER, the actual explicit cloud, the ceiling height and the visibility. We have smart inits that don't necessarily simulate exactly what you think is going out in your model, which is a whole other issue. What, what we get in GFE at the end of the day isn't necessarily exactly what your model generated when it left NCO. So that, that's another whole thing that we're trying to address with uh, a the MDLs leading a national smart inits team that is assuring that the that, that, uh, eastern region and central region and western region offices all do the same thing when they take the data and they initialize it in GFE. So getting it into AWIPS is one step, and then getting it to GFE where we can manipulate the grid is another. So the answer question is there's a lot less reliance on RH to estimate 
but there are still tools out there if you want to run through a model and say, you know, this simple RH tool, what ceiling base height will it give you? So we're getting there. We haven't even got there to every office in central region, and I, I'm guessing similar for other regions. Then the question is, once we get that, are, how are we using it? Are we looking at it visually and then going in and manually typing the cloud height in a text product tab? Or are we using the grid to generate a format? So the answer is there's a huge spectrum still, at least in the field from what I see. Um, but we're up to probably 20 to 30 offices in the Weather Service that look at gridded ceiling visibility in GFE and then generate forecast tasks out of a formatter. But there's still the others are still probably doing it mainly by hand. There's a time light. It's okay. Yeah. The reason why I was asking was because when we get feedback, when we go to the test beds, I remember asking the Taunton forecaster because he was telling me, oh, the NAM tends to have um, a fog bias or a low cloud bias. And I, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then I remember to ask him, so was it based upon RH, or was it based upon ceiling heights or cloud amounts? And he goes, oh, I, I don't know. I'd have to get back to you on that. Point being, it severs the feedback loop, the feedback that we get from the field as to what exactly is the issue in the model. And if we know those exact details, I think we would be able to respond better and more quickly to make those model improvements. Because we can go to other developers and say, here's exactly what's happening. OK, let's go fix it. Um, I'll just say one, uh, just one quick thing. Um, that, yes, as, as Jeff mentioned, if, they're, if they want to make any sort of intelligent tweaks where they're not just drawing stuff in, RH and Precip is what they have. Um, so that, that that's one issue. Uh, I can talk to you about some offline about some of the other things I've discovered on how various different offices are doing things. I kind of have a on paper and in my brain summary of some of that. So, but you like to synthesize I agree. We should try and synthesize that. Yeah, Ben does a lot of the test bed stuff. I have to deal with the operational realities on our forecast floor. Um, the raw materials, like your cloud species, uh, your mixing ratios, they're available if you know how to dig. But I know at least on our production floor, the time to dig is not there. And so we are still using very simplistic, inelegant, linear, things that were developed in the you know decades before my life to produce an estimate of, well, will the ceiling be below 1,000 feet AGL, for example? And you know, it's the science has to get to the point where a forecaster can take a look at the material he's given, make his decision, and sometimes it's for a point. Sometimes you're talking about somebody who's got to cover two states. Or in our case, we have forecasters that have to cover one-third of CONUS. You've got other people who have an even larger scope in which to handle cloud. And they're looking for a tool that works. I have a few curious people that want to know what's behind the tool. But the first thing they want to know if I bring something to the floor is, show me it works. Show me that I can replace something I'm doing today with this new tool because I don't have the time to add it. Okay. Um, okay. One, one more. Yeah. Uh, great topic, Brad. 
good idea to ask about this. So, you know, it is true that from our end as model developers, we're trying to think of what is the best uh, aspects of the fields that are being produced to produce the best possible ceiling uh, visibility diagnostics. And so I, I was also a little surprised to find out, you know, that, gosh, uh, including at this meeting even, there's a lot of re-diagnosis that's taking place in the forecast office, and that's probably why you brought up the topic. And so I guess we, we developers, you know, want to know how, are we doing the right thing? I think that we are, but tell us otherwise. I, I know there's been issues about getting the ceiling and visibility fields into uh, AWIPS even, I believe, from some of the models, maybe from her and RAP even. But uh, so right now, technically, we're working on this whole issue of subgrid scale clouds as a, another component, and, and it's even with the HER. It actually turns out it's a big deal even, even at the HER scale. And so we would like to kind of have some flexibility to, you know, bring in the technical information to best do these fields and diagnose them, but also, I guess, work with the community with AWP and guys also to have that be a useful uh, field. But I guess this alignment together is a great point for bringing up this topic, Brad. Thanks. I just I'll have one last little thing and then go on to some, talk about something else. And ceiling and visibility is the spare point. But I'm looking up at Gene, and I know that the four-dimensional cloud problem is really where we want to go with this. So I'm hoping that in the next, as part of this process, we address this sort of five-dimensional aspect of the atmosphere. It's not just in space, it's not just in time, but it's the different species and different attributes. And really that's what we're dealing with. That's what the science is dealing with from both the remote sensing standpoint as well as the modeling and as well as the forecasting. So I hope that gets included in the final vision that we're talking about and moving forward. Thanks, Brad. Um, seems like we've wandered from one topic to another here. And just to kind of try to put a little closure to this particular one uh, regarding the ceilings and, uh, and so forth, it kind of sounds to me like there's, there's a need for certainly more communication, more awareness of what the forecasters are doing with the guidance and the output that, that the modelers are providing, and I think we need to build that in somehow, either in this meeting or provide some other opportunities where we can get people together to have that kind of interaction. So I think that's probably an action that we need to have here. Uh, the topic we wandered from, which was what Jeff Domago and, and Mike had brought up, uh, more or less asking, where's where's the where, where are we going with the forecasters and their role? Just to kind of put closure to that, uh, Jeff Craven uh, kind of indicated that waiting for word from on high to come down that we need to do this probably is going to be a while in coming. Uh, I kind of saw a lot of heads nodding around the room, kind of agreeing with that. Uh, it sounds to me like what that maybe implies is that somehow we need to get a group together to start to come up with ideas in terms of what is the role of the forecaster, what is the role of the, how does it, all of this fit together with the integrated field structure that we keep hearing about, and either provide those ideas up to whoever's responsibility it is to, to bless it and execute it, or if we don't get that, maybe we just start doing it anyway. Hendrick had mentioned that he was he, he had been waiting for um, I don't know, a modeling council of some sort to provide guidance on, on Unify and everything. He's stepping out with that. I think some of these things have kind of got to be done in concert with each other. Um, and so I guess I'm proposing that there be uh, some group that maybe Craven and myself and I can, uh, can get together and start to work on the role of the forecaster on. And should we list this as some kind of action item? I want to make sure um, yeah. Andrew has something to do here. Yeah, and, well, Andrew's typing like crazy down here. Oh, okay. I just uh, wanted, right away, wanted to put a, it up on that screen, too. You, we'll, we'll get over to the other screen. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, by the way, we I have uh, talents of Andrew Ostrip... <laughs> Andrew O. Andrew O. Here. <laughs> 
who is the scribe for this session. He's capturing everything you're, we're, that you're saying. So, so he's capturing everything that's being said here. Uh, in a moment, we're going to start going through a list of items and come up with additional action items. Um, but <coughs> Andrew's here to, to help us, and I really appreciate it. OK, other topics. We probably have another 10, 15 minutes to, for open discussion. Then I'd like to transition into more specific uh, Action item like recommendations and so forth. Uh, okay. Ah, you got the mic already. Great. Hendrick, I, I wanted to mention, you know, you specifically brought up Joaquin as an example of, you know, the ensembles and how they were utilized. And, and you know, that's a, you know, we've been trying to push to look at more ensembles for hurricane track forecasts. And Joaquin is a, a great example of. Some people would say, well, there's a large spread. You know, we should have known the forecast uncertainty was very high. But Joaquin's also an example of a, a case in which you know, we modified our deterministic forecast away from um, the deterministic model suite, uh, which at a time was much more correct than the ensemble. Um, the, uh, the, the European and the GFS ensembles that I showed uh, if you looked at the respective deterministic at the time, the deterministic beat the pants off the, the ensemble mean. Uh, so there's a basic science issue there. I, mean, I had a nice lunchtime discussion with a few folks about that, and you know I can only really talk to to some extent about the hurricane. You know we're trying to get into the weeds about how you know uh, the hurricane the track is dependent on intensity and storm structure. Um, it's just the use of ensembles, I think there's some very important science issues there in that particular issue. I mean, ensembles, are in, we want to get ensembles for uncertainty, and at least for hurricane track, I'm not quite sure we're there yet. All right, and I, I think we've heard other comments uh, throughout the day today regarding the issue of science and, and how it might relate to the ensemble and the probabilities that may come from that. Um, I think we need to go kind of evolve in parallel both the needs of the forecasters and the, and the capabilities that we might be able to get out of the ensemble from the standpoint of probabilistic forecasting. Um, but uh, yeah, again, it goes back to, I think, kind of like the issue that Ming raised this morning, is it's science issues and we need to, you know, try to say, I mean, we're a science-based service organization. We need to provide the service, but we also have to have the science here as well. I think maybe that's how we tie this back in is that Ming also brought up that when you're dealing with requirements, you typically have a balance of, of user-derived functional requirements that are coming in or requirements pull, and then a push from the technology and science side. It's like we're showing you what's, uh, you know, what's possible, and this in and of itself can be generating a requirement. So I think the same approach can be taken with this whole issue of the forecast process, what's our plan, how are we actually going to use, deliver, uh, and have our forecasters interact with probabilistic information. I was not suggesting that we wait for something on high. I was actually making the point that if we that we can't afford to wait. So maybe maybe the maybe we can use this analog of the you know requirements pull, tech push in this sense too. And maybe this whole group we're going to be re reconvening tomorrow in the STI side. I think maybe that's a, maybe that's the an STI-led group, which probably led by the SSDs in the field, might be the right people to go ahead and take this on. Right. So I, I guess if there's an action here, it's that we take that issue into the STI meeting tomorrow and Friday. OK. Matt, new topic? And close out on some on more of a response and close out on two of the things that we've we've been discussing. I want to bring it back to how Hendrick introduced us, and that is the notion of where does our future lie and how do we do long-term strategic scale planning, on, planning on strategic time scales for our environmental modeling suite. And a, a quick warning to whoever it was who asked the question of what do the forecasters do um, when they make cloud heights. There are two dangers. One of them is that assuming that the 120-odd 
things that we're doing out there represents a good scientific best practice. It's what gets the job done today operationally. That's fine. And I was one of those forecasters for 10 years. I know. That doesn't make it smart, and that doesn't mean that's what we should plan to do. It is clear to me that at the highest level, we've got a vision of probabilistic products. And ensembles probably have a very good and a very big role in determining flow dependent, the flow dependent aspect of that uncertainty. One can come up with uncertainty in a forecast without an ensemble, but it won't be flow dependent. So it's important, and that's the big lesson from Sandy and Joaquin. There are two or three other really good lessons to remember. Um, there are two pieces of what we do. One of them is that grinded out day after day after day forecast that lives in the NDFD. And the other one is the extremely high impact, it's important to message it kind of event. So don't ignore the, either one. They both pay the bills. The other thing is we got to, the best guidance we're getting from one hop is that it's going to be that day-to-day -day stuff is going to be more probabilistic. And we're going to have to define what that means. We're not going to get that from above. So a number of the things that we have discussed, including at lunch, and will go into that STI meeting, will be an important part of figuring out how we take the National Digital Forecast Database and make it something that's more probabilistic. Do not assume that the way that the models give input to the noble forecaster who then changes it is going to be a pattern that we continue 10 years from now. When I joined the Weather Service, the forecast lived in a pile of words that I typed. It doesn't do that anymore. We've made the transition into a forecast that lives, into the, num that lives in the numbers. And those numbers are going to change to something other than the numbers that we know today. And defining the science behind that and the probability distributions and the techniques that we're going to use is probably not something that AFS is going to give us as a requirement. We're probably going to, the folks in this room are some of the smartest ones who are going to figure that stuff out. OK, thank you, Matt. All right, any other topics? Any other burning issues people want to address? We'll take one more. So this is still the same topic. I think we need a bit of a philosophy switch and stop thinking of the deterministic as something that's different from the ensemble and start thinking of the deterministic uh, as a slightly better ensemble member. Because, yes, the deterministic for Joaquin might have done better, but you could also say that about some individual members. So saying the deterministic one, I mean, is not that much different than saying one of the ensemble members won. There's always going to be an ensemble member that wins. So we need to stop thinking of the deterministic as this, this special little snowflake and start thinking of it at, in terms of the broader ensemble. Uh, this is exactly why in that five-layer system, I want the GFS to have a native resolution ensemble from itself. So the deterministic GFS is just a control member of an ensemble with the same resolution but with different, different perturbations <laughs> in the physical initial conditions. Um, I just kind of got in here a little while ago, so I hope I, this hasn't been already discussed, and it may actually go into this last bullet down in here. But, you know, getting OBS into the production suite, is this also kind of similar to, you know, should we be updating the, the production suite a little bit more often so that, you know, this does happen? I mean, is that kind of one and the same? It's kind of like the discussion you and I had earlier in the day. Yeah. Um, actually, this may be a good segue into the list of issues we've got up here, and we can start by addressing that particular one. Uh, all right, maybe we'll work from the bottom on up then. 
Um, <coughs> where, where up there was that? Uh, get, okay, the bottom bullet there, getting options in the production suite. Um, how can this be done faster? Well, yeah, there's probably a lot of dependency. Okay, back up a second. This list that's up on the screen here right now is just my quick hitting list of what I thought some of the major issues were discussed over the past couple of days. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we can we can uh, edit this, we can delete items, we can add items, and so forth. But the motivation here is to see if there's any actions that we want to take from these issues uh, and find people to be responsible for uh, carrying out these actions with the idea in mind that when we meet here next year, we can see how far along we've gotten on these issues. So let's, let's start with the one you just raised, Bill, getting ops in the production suite. Is there anything more you want to say about that? He's probably tired of me yelling, uh, you know, Mr. Himawardy here. Um, but, you know, I mean, but there is an awful lot of stuff coming here. The MRMRS stuff is coming out. We've got, you know, by the time I'm hearing that we're finally going to get, uh, you know, Himawari into the production suite, Gozar is going to be up there. And I'm hoping that we start trying to find ways that we can break eggs with, you know, whatever's out there first, and then similar things that can be done are done that way as well. I remember somebody also stating here that, you know, earlier in the week that, you know, I think they said back in 1997 they had done an update to the GFS but ended up having to back out because there was too many problems, and so they went back to the old iteration. Well, I mean, that's a long time ago, and I'm hoping, you know, we still don't have some issues with trying to find ways to maybe update the cycles a little more often so that we can get these new data sets and everything else in there. Because I mean, I think that would certainly answer the question. How can this be done to get OBS into the production suite a, a lot quicker and also, you know, what can we do to actually build the GFS so that, you know, we finally start kicking the European butt? Okay, so basically you're looking for a quicker process and more out Yes. Is there an action that we can take on this? I guess I'm going to look to Hendrick on that. Is there an action that we can take on this? Uh, I, I know we had a presentation this morning that described, uh, I guess it was John Derber, that described a, what seemed to be a fairly rigorous process to go from the ob first arriving to ultimately being used in the model. It's all a question of uh, risk assessment and benefit assessment. We have been, we have been uh, by many of our users, pushed to make sure that we don't do harm and that we don't break things as we go forward. If our forecasters, or if our customers keep telling us that, then the process that John showed is essential. If you are willing to take risks in the hope that you get benefit from new data earlier, then you can make the process faster. But then go, and go back to me and complain that we were not rigorous enough and that something went wrong during the, with something else as we try to fix it. It's a very difficult balance in a very complex forecast system how you balance risk versus benefit. Well, okay, let's. Is this even up here? I know that we had talked about this earlier, but you know, this is where we got to find a way to make sure that the parallel runs can get out there and people can assess that a lot quicker. And you know, because 30 days is not enough. I, I think that I think the practical way of getting that this is what we talked about too. I mean, that, that 30 day is not what we should do the the, the evaluation with. There's also the issue, and that's, John has uh, that issue a little bit, but in terms of modeling systems, we have that more. If, the G, if we are ready with the GFS to go in, uh, and this is not a ding on anybody, we have to wait for MDL to get, get the mass fixed, if necessary. We need to wait for uh, <coughs> New York City to fix uh, the impact that they get from uh, the water center who has to figure out how to fix what they get from us. And so uh, there are a few things we can do. We can, out of principle, uh, start data feeds of early parallels to the field. 
Yes. That, that would be something that would not impact the risk of the actual baseline operational system. That's an we, so that, that is something we can look at and see if we can do that. Uh, but that is something that you really need NCO around the table because it's all resource-based. Um, I don't see NCO here right now, but I, I know we've had a discussion over and over, so that's not new. The other thing which is really new that we've never done in the production suite before, December 2nd, we implemented GEFS V11. We are still running GEFS V10 in operations. The only other time we've done that was the CFS V1 overlap with CFS V2. We need to get <coughs> corporate buy-in, or we need, as a, as a user group, as a core on the floor group, we need to decide what the business model is of going forward with, with, with operational implementations. Are we doing what we've done right now? We get an operational implementation ready. The old one gets replaced by the new. The sunset date of the old model is the start date of the new model. Or are we going to label, for instance, the GFS, uh, or for instance, the next GEFS implementation. It will take the water center in New York City somewhere between 12, well, between 9 and 15 months to get their system ready to work with GEFS V12. Do we wait that year until our downstream users are ready? Or are we implementing and sunsetting the old model a year later? So there, there are ways of doing business that we could change that would allow us to get operational support for new data and new model bits and pieces much earlier. But it requires a different way of doing business, and it requires buy-in also all the way up from, from, from the IA. And for instance, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the <coughs> response of the GEFS implementation to HEFS and to New York City, there's an enormous amount of pushback from uh, Bill and from Louis on that for understandable reasons. Because if we allow systems to overlap, we open the door for not being able to shut down an old system. And going back to trying uh, to, uh, uh, how long did it take us to stop the LFM? <laughs> Boy. <laughs> yeah, just a, uh, I want to throw one more thing out here before, and then I'm, I'll yield the mic here. Um, we've got to make sure that we engage AWIPS here, too, and, and it's got to be done as soon as possible so that that can be set in front of the forecasters. And that's something that, you know, I mean, at least we got a little bit of the AWIPS folks here this week which has been a change from the past, but this has got to be done so that we can, the forecasters can see this right away, and, and that, I think, would help the process, too. You really, need, you really need to go to more than this, because you cannot just make a little bit bigger bandwidth and assume that you can go from 2% to 15 percent It's basically uh, Einstein's definition of insanity. If you keep doing the same thing, you'll look like you're okay? Okay, so, so it looks like at least for... Yeah, I intimately related to this conversation. And the way I'll describe it is or what the issues about uh, bringing in new data is our process within EMC is for a new data set like MORE, like uh, the uh, DMSPF 17 CIs, or you, know, you name it, is very much the same process as changing an algorithm. Nobody's going to let us say, well, you know, we've got a better algorithm. We know it's better because, you know, we've done our offline testing. Uh, so we'll go operational with it next week. Uh, and, and that's kind of where we are. I mean, that's kind of how we view a large new data set. You know, give us one more aircraft ob of the same kind that we've been using. Okay, we do that on the fly pretty much. But uh, give us hemispheric scans at 500 meter resolution on 37 uh, wavelengths. That's a big change to the model. Uh, so I don't have an action, but uh, just as a concept, that's the concept. And maybe that's not the right concept. So the question to, to bring back is, should we be more liberal about new data sources than we are about new algorithms. Okay. 
one thing to add, and I mean, certainly we, have to, we do have to balance the risk versus benefit. There's no question about that. And I, I guess, uh, and then correct me if I'm wrong, with, with this Himawari case, um, what is the, the risk of losing the, the MT stat radiances for this year and a half period on, on the production cycle? Yeah. Um, um, now you're preaching to the choir. Uh, Bob, do you want to answer again? <laughs> we we have we have some ice satellites or satellites that we use for the ice products that are seven eight years beyond uh, design life. Yet, uh, if we make that point to uh, uh, the higher up planning, or used to make that point up to the higher up planning, that that's actually a risk, and we should do something about it. And that, therefore, we should make it a high priority to actually switch in existing newer data sources. Then uh, uh, we still end up in a situation that, uh, well, when it breaks, we fix it. And, and I don't like that. And so I'm, I'm very happy that you asked the question. And yes, I wish that we would make that a little bit more of a priority item for, for moving stuff in. OK, so, so it looks like we have. Oh, okay. You were you were asked to respond. The, okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, since I was named, um, so uh, in addition, the uh, uh, CIs. I simply at, at one point, and not so simply, but I, I uh, brought in a new satellite and a new algorithm. I had to because the last satellite that was still flying uh, that I was able to use. Side. So, okay, I did that job. That, on the other hand, that introduced a discontinuity, and all the con climate people are very unhappy with me uh, because there's a discontinuity. And even though the new algorithm's inarguably better in terms of what it produces on the field, um, you know, its analysis, uh, it's a change. And the fact that it's a change, from their eyes, means it's worse. So, many considerations. I have at least one documented case of end users asking me if I could please keep a system unchanged for, ten, for the next 10 years so that they didn't have to adjust their way of operations. OK. Um, so for this particular item, Hendrick suggests that we can start Speeds uh, earlier for the parallel run. Is there somebody that can take that action? Is that your there action? How do we? That is something that we need to do on, on an implementation by implementation basis. We're already looking at that with the, with the parallel, but I'll make sure that we work that with MCO. Okay. Can you put it All right. Let, let's see if we can work through this list a little bit and see if there's uh, uh, see what else is actionable out of here. Uh, model evaluations. One of the things I heard, uh, uh, I believe it was yesterday, was getting the private sector and academia, uh, that probably should add academia to this, into the model evaluations along with the field personnel. Um, I presume there's no objection to that. Um, I don't see Glenn White or. That, that was right, now we, right now, that would be Becky next time. Okay. But uh, as we change over the, uh, the, the where we do the evaluation, it may be coming out. So uh, just, say, just say MTO and EMT. Okay. And then basically we'll be back in the Okay, the next one up, we kind of. Okay, the next one up, uh, who does all the post processing on all the ensembles? We kind of beat that up over the past hour. Uh, Bill? Yeah, before we jump back up there, I want to ask a question here because um, this may have kind of gone into the earlier conversation we had before lunch, but just the same on the model and evaluations, engaged private sector and academia. I think that's a great topic and, and something that needs to be looked at. But um, one of the things that happens also with the private sector and certainly with the academia is, you know, they help in a way provide solutions, let's call it, rather than, you know, helping out with requirements. 
is this something that needs to be done is they are building things. Um, how do we get that into the production suite so that we're not continuing to do solutions rather than creating requirements and stuff and having tons of things into the um, forecast offices that can be a little bit disparate from what's happening with EMC. It seems like that's a different issue. It could be. I just evaluation. Um, you're talking about them being more involved with the development with the new concepts into the. Yeah, and maybe that's a different topic altogether here too. And get them involved in, uh, in uh, the whole edge GPS process. We're building teams there. We deliberately make teams with internal people from EMC and external, which can be both academia and um, and uh, the rest of the government. Uh, that's a place where we could uh, look at the private sector too. There's there's one strategic problem with involving the private sector because if we involve the private sector in such a way that somebody in the private sector gets earlier access to our experimental data than others, then we have a legal issue. Yes. You're right. And so and so the key for this is that we yes, I want to get the private sector more involved in the evaluations, but the key is to first set up a system that we publicize the results that we are going to be using for the evaluation to the general public and then bring in the private sector because if I do it the other way around, I'm setting myself up for lawsuits and all kinds of other crap. So uh, an another piece uh, here is that we also have other government agencies. Okay. Yeah, so I, I don't see any reason why other government agencies can't be involved. Uh, actually, it's that, that's already that's already happening uh, both directly and indirectly on the on the ocean side. Uh, um, uh, we actually use the uh, uh, validation data that the Navy creates directly, and we have them involved in, in, in our process. We use the international community to actually set, set the uh, validation statistics and techniques. Um, it's also very good to look at uh, uh, the fact that NOS, for their models already, uh, has a model advisory board that meets every month that uh, we have input in and the other way around. So, so, yes, absolutely, and it's not like we're not trying to work to that already. Coast Guard, for instance, is very much involved. I could just add our partners at NASA in terms of modeling land data sets, et cetera, et cetera, USGS for water, et cetera. So there's a, there's a, and then, of course, the international setting as well. And I think I mentioned this earlier uh, before lunch, so we, we, we we can't just be NOAA centric. I mean, because we're doing, you know, basically Earth system modeling. So, so, so uh, all I'm trying to say, not not uh, negating that that's happening, but just trying to call that out and 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 have it, uh, you know, uh, ha have it written down here as well. Andrew, could, could you add other government agencies? Okay, okay thank you. Um, Okay, the issue of post-processing ensembles, we've, we've kind of beat that up a little bit. I guess I would propose that the action on that be that we take that to the SPI meeting. There's also going to be the post-processing meeting in January. Yeah, we'll be effectively working that with MDL and uh, OAR and EMC. So that, that the, the, the big issue there is not the fact that we're not working. It's a big issue is that we make sure that everybody's involved and that we report it out in the right places. So is there a better specific action on that? Slight delay on that. Yeah. Hello. I would say less, I, I would like this less specific, uh, not more specific, because it's not just the, the ensemble. Um, I think we're going to be talking at this post-processing workshop. There are post-processing actions that happen at the NSEP service centers, too. Uh, all the players have got to be involved. So it's not just between EMC and MDL. But yeah, I agree that this action really is something that's going to be addressed directly at this workshop. Can we put a name with this? Mike Sarah. Mike Sarah. Okay. All right. Hey, I like that. <laughs> I don't know if Mike does, but okay. I'll take Mike Okay. All right. Um, another
number of people mentioned Irma in RCMA <coughs> and wanting various improvements, various fields added, uh, have it produced more frequently. I think I saw a suggestion up to 15, every 15 minutes. What is it we really want to do about improvements for RCMA? Is there an action here that we can bring forth that will satisfy some of these mentioned needs? Jeff? Well, I mean, my suggestion would be that, that uh, unless you're unhappy with the way we're doing it, and I, I keep getting accolades for my RTMA team, uh, so we'll continue to uh, respond to the questions. We have group meetings that uh, uh, now that we've got the 30-day underway, we've, we'll stop canceling those monthly meetings where we discuss p things uh, on the telecom. So we'll continue to do that, and, I, and we have committed to doing a, a twice-yearly update to RTMA IRMA. Uh, so I, I'm not sure. We I think within that the existing meeting structure, I think we can gather the requirements, gather the feedback, and and map to the uh, you know the map those requirements and request no not request requirements feedback into the next upgrade you know that down the line. So as part of the the envisioned improving the implementation process, we have been talking about putting up uh, somewhat more formalized meetings slash workshops to uh, start off each implementation cycle. And um, we haven't talked in detail about that yet, but either the existing update uh, mon monthly file uh, meetings that they have, or uh, we may have to set up a, a separate little workshop for that uh, every six months to just uh, get input from the from the community. We'll, we'll figure it out, but the whole idea is with the with the, with the new with with the ideas of how where we want to bring the implementation process, we are definitely needing to make sure that we pull the right people and the right customers at the beginning of each cycle to see where we're going. And and the RTMA and Irma is a little bit ahead of that because we do have these these uh, monthly uh, tag up shops uh, tag up meetings already. It may not not be big enough, and it may not have the right people, but at least we got to start there. So with the uh, earlier we saw a presentation uh, with, which, which I think had a very nice case study showing the, the impacts of having many, many OBS in a small, in, in a single grid point. Uh, an improvement in the IRMA and RTMA may be in the eye of the beholder. I, I don't think we can us underestimate the need for, I think that people familiar with data assimilation, familiar with analysis, can easily understand and appreciate what we saw with the DCA of. I think that there's a whole host of people that will be giving Jeff and his group, uh, you know, there's legitimate issues and complex terrain, and there's also the issue you saw there that is a enormous culture and training issue, uh, a giant elephant stand. So when we say improvements, it, part of the improvement of the IRMA RTMA, in my mind, is accepting that it isn't the same as we've been doing business for decades. The expectation that it's going to, I think it would, it, it's going to, it's going to take a series and a lot of time in order for forecasters and users to appreciate that. But again, maybe maybe that's easy to appreciate if you're in the model community and you understand how data can't always be used exactly. But I think it's, it's a powerful culture issue that we have. I don't know who else can address it. And I, I've, I've talked about it in the National Models team. I don't think that I can just tell forecasters and other users that easily that you can accept those things. So that, to me, that has to be a priority is that we educate 
the shift towards analyses being ground truth rather than point data, or else I think you're going to continue to get developers getting a lot of feedback about something that is very acceptable in the objective analysis world given the constraints, but won't be acceptable to people that aren't educated to understand it. You know, maybe maybe I'm just the only one that's ignorant on it, but I think it's a powerful thing. So, yeah, it, that's that's a we need motion from both sides, and we're learning from the data simulation side as well. So, um, you know, like Matt said, maybe that 20% difference in the in the weighting that we're giving to the METARs should be 60% instead. And it, you know, it's uh, the motion from the data simulation side is somewhat slow, and the education on the part of the uh, the users is is also slow. But we will find a place in the middle where we're both happy. Okay, so let, let me backtrack here a second. First, in terms of explicit improvements, now I'm going to come back to you, Joe. Uh, in, in terms of explicit improvements, you've got this process, you've got these meetings, calls, and so forth. You're going to continue with that, um, maybe in the framework that Hendrick described. Um, so we're okay with the method and, and approach to improvements right now. Everybody's comfortable with the way Jeff is conducting this, I think is what I'm hearing. Well, it, it, has, it has been one of the three places where we, where as EMC, We've been getting kudos from the field for, for the way we are responsible and interact. So, okay. so this is not a thing that is broken. It needs to be fixed uh, more than anything else. Okay. So then in terms of Jeff Craven's comment, first off, yeah, you, we expect you'll be making changes with methodology and so forth, as you said, weightings and, and that sort of thing. But there's an education and training component in terms of forecasters and other users accepting the analysis as truth as opposed to necessarily the observations is what I'm hearing from you, Jeff. And so we need we need to begin to develop those educational and training materials probably sooner rather than later in concert with the development so that we're bringing the users along with the development. And we will need a champion on your side for that. That's not something we can do. And I'm seeing Leroy Spade sitting up there from the Office of the Chief Learning Officer, and uh, perhaps we can enlist some of their help on that. Not, not wanting to, to beat a dead horse there, but the whole DCA issue is a representative issue. Anyhow, I'm living on right. the water. The temperature changes over the first hill behind the water like crazy. So if I absorb all the water like to do with DCA, it's not going to be for that anyway. Okay. Okay. Hey, Ken. This is Steve Zubrick on the line. Can, I have a comment that what Jeff Craven just said about the RTMA and, in particular, the example that was shown earlier this morning uh, from, uh, I think, Steve Levine about DCA. Right. Go ahead. Uh, just for what it's worth, that uh, image was taken in mid-July of this year. Uh, three weeks later, I led a team of uh, people to that site to conduct some uh, sensitivity studies of the temperature sensor there, and we brought the temperature sensor back, and we sent it away for testing, and it turned out that it was 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit too warm. So in the example there, DCA was 72, and I think the background turned out to be 69, a lot of the stations were, I think, pretty close to 69 to 70. Uh, so in that situation, that analysis actually worked out fairly well in pointing out that our ASOS was reading too warm. Checks in the mail. <laughs> All right, so another component to this, then, is that in a way it has So that particular observation point, DCA, was featured in the Capital Weather Gang. Thank you very much, Steve Tracton, if you're still there. And uh, we replaced the sensor on, I think it was August 7th. And it, it, it knocked it down about two degrees. Okay, thank you, Steve. Okay, next 
item up there, longer term plans for SRF and HRF. Actually, this kind of came out of, uh, I think, part of Chef Domingo's proposal for regional ensembles and short term ensembles. Jeff, any action to those? Well, the, the action is that there, the, as part of the MEG planning, uh, one of the two teams, uh, one of the three teams that are going to be put together. Uh, coordinated by the MEG and, and populated by SUS and, and others. One is on convection allowing scale ensemble, which is the HRF are the key part of that plan. Uh, so I assume we'll be assembling that group and we'll be discussing my pro a pro my proposal and, and other counter proposals. Um, the uh, you know we I, I do feel we have to come up with a plan fairly soon if we're going to. Uh, use a substantial chunk of the Cray computer, and we'll have to make a good case for that. And uh, I don't think we have a hard. I, I didn't think we would have a hard time making that case. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have to go through the MDC or not. So, but I think there's a pretty good plan, and and it's a matter of putting the uh, populating the team and starting those discussions. So is that the action, populating the team and getting that team rolling? That's what. I would suggest, and it's being done. I, I think we that that's already been initiated and calling for volunteers and. So what what more what might you Dave Myrick I think is coordinating that. What more might we need that this time next year uh, we will be able to report some progress and some you know some some activity. Well, I, I sure would hope we would have a, a pretty darn good plan in place and might even have some uh, preliminary results uh, to discuss. For example, uh, what Steve Weiss talked about happening at the spring program uh, where there's multiple groups who do convection allowing scale ensembles, uh, trying to do that in a more in a coordinated way so that uh, we can examine those. Uh, and, and subset them and come up with uh, some evidence to consider for the population of the of the HREF. Okay, so putting together this team to produce this plan and maybe have some some results by this time next year. Okay, so I didn't think of, we would. So there's been <laughs> Jeff says there's been nine volunteers already for that team. So that's. If you look at the stress part, I mean, there's there's some suggestions from uh, UMAC to discontinue it, and there's some other thing, bits, bits and pieces. That really depends on that most most crowded piece of the production suite, how we go forward. So the the, the bigger issue with the stress is uh, is over the next few months build a um, uh, a uh, a strategic plan for simplifying and unifying the production suite, and and that will tell us. Uh, uh, how long? Uh, give us an idea of how, if and how long we want to keep running the SREF, and if and what we need to do in terms of the science and development work to uh, to get that replaced. So, so the SREF, the HREF is is more a, is a little better defined because it basically fills a new slot. The SREF has really need to be discussed in the com in combination with uh, uh, the NAM, the REP, the GAFs, the uh, the GFS, and even possibly the H4. Okay, Jeff, so you're going to be more or less leading that up with that. Yeah, whoever ends up being the chair of that team, okay. All right, um, getting down to the last two, at least, that I had here. Uh, the last one, actually. Um, Boundary layer issues. Are there specific actions that it needs to be taken to address these issues? Is there anything we can do? Yeah, there was a probably. Yeah, we, we have we have had a, a number of conversations on how to move ahead and address the issue, particularly in the GFS and the GIFs, in terms of both uh, physics 
work as well as possible data assimilation work to try and um, place more focus on this um, in the GFS. It's something that's a, a continuous problem with all modeling, whether it be um, RAP, HER, uh, NAM, as well as um, GFS and GAFS, although the, the, the GFS system has been uh, having bigger problems compared to some of the others. So we have a, uh, beginnings of a working plan um, to move ahead on that. And whether we need a larger group, admittedly, from, from SPC's perspective, we're focusing primarily on convective environments. But as, as Jeff Manikin has uh, shown in a number of the MEG meetings, it isn't just the uh, convective situations where uh, some of the boundary layer structures are, are in error as well. So there may be a broader need to, uh, to try and address that. So is there something we can do so that when we come back here next year, you'll be able to say, hey, I saw progress? I can say one more thing. Um, SPC plans to work more closely with the global branch. I've already had discussions with VJ um, so that we can uh, tag up more frequently and provide feedback and discussions on this. So at least for the convective part of the boundary layer, structural problems. Um, we certainly expect to be able to have some, some positive feedback by next year at this time. In fact, we're going to hope to see some, some positives uh, with sooner than that, if at all possible. Yeah, this is... Uh, at least with some experimental and parallel runs. This is an issue that uh, the MEG brought to the forefront uh, this past summer, and uh, we're we're going to stay on top of it uh, through the year. Uh, we know that the new version of the GFS mitigates the issue, not nearly as much as the RAP and HER mitigate their issue. We don't have a lot of um, experience now validating what the new GFS does in real time. We're just starting to look at some of the retro runs, but we haven't. We have some stats that uh, seem to show improvement. We don't have really looking at it day to day in the, in the warm time of year, which we will have to do uh, this coming uh, summer as, a, as part of the day to day activities in the MEG. And we need your help in, uh, in, in looking at this. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it. We need uh, volunteers for MEG presentations on that and all issues. Uh, we, we keep an eye on things as best we can, but uh, we, we can't do it with the same diligence that uh, all of you can. And so, so that is the new way of doing business, but it's also business as usual because we we are looking at fixing a single model. And so, so yes, uh, as part of the thing is, you should see next year a new GFS has been implemented with a significantly improved uh, surface temperature, <coughs> and and at least uh, not as bad. Let's put it that way. Uh, but the, the second step is to systematically tackle the issue of physics, and. What we're doing with that is right now, while we're having this meeting, there's another meeting going on of the NGGPS physics group. And um, if you just uh, took a look at some of Brad's uh, uh, early slides, that tells you what the problem is. We have, what is it, four models and six different boundary layer schemes in there. And so, so <laughs> that's what we need to fix. So we will not be able next year to give you a unified physics system physics model that we're going to use all through the uh, modeling suite, but at the very least next year, by this time, we should have a strategic plan to get there, and that should be reported out here. Okay. I do have something to say. Um, one of the ways we can tackle some of the physics is actually go down to the component level and look at what what's going on, and that's what Hendrik had talked about, the meeting that's going on right now, et cetera. So we can address those things down at the fundamental level, because ultimately it's a physics wheel of pain, as Brad Ferrier showed, But and this is our work with you know the more research side of things and so on. And then at the same time, we can start addressing some of the other things that are going on in the PBL. Uh, what, are the, what are the winds you know, and the downscaling issues there? What do you have for your very very stable boundary layers. I said very, very. I'm looking up to our, uh, let me see, that would be upper 
uh, left and Alaska and so on, but, you know, in, inversion, stable boundary layers, all those kinds of things. So these, there's a whole host of things. Uh, I noticed we didn't have precip up there. I mean, everybody's fine with precip. So anyway, a lot of physics. All right, that's my initial list. What's missing? What's be added? Are these big enough steps forward? Not seeing any hands shoot up. Still awake. Yeah, how many are still awake? Uh, is this sufficient? Is this all we can get out of this meeting? Certainly, I didn't hit every item. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm going to speak out earlier. The one. Uh, I'm an ensemble team leader here. The Bureau of Open asked me to, did you tell people the GIFs implement this week? Yeah, I say, I say, say uh, we did present one slide, yeah. Global ensemble implement uh, December 2nd, and uh, Hendrix mentioned that one. I want to say over here, the two things. One, the, I heard many people talking about ensemble, probably the forecast, okay? So the, we have an uh, ensemble youth workshop every two years. The last one is the uh, 13th, no, 14th spring. And the next one is uh, we plan June 20, June 13th, 15th, three days here, okay? So the I think we have enough time at that time talking about ensemble, okay? So second one, I didn't hear anybody mention that one, the the data. Ensemble, global ensemble already in operation for 23 years, okay? I'm working on ensemble in nearly 20 years. The ensemble system, we produce 21 members four times per day right now, okay? So 21 members, the almost uh, uh, eight years. But our fear, the WFO only get the 10 of the 21 members on their system, okay? I didn't hear anybody complain or they are satisfied on the, I scientific, I tell you, 10 members, it's so really weird to represent uncertainty or, uh, you know, you, you, everybody knows that one. What does that mean, 10 members? 21 members, still not enough. Many complaints from a hurricane center and uh, users say that 20 members maybe not really represent uncertainty. Okay, we think about increased resolution next time. But the 10, 10 members right now, still the situation, the, all the, WFO in their system, okay. And uh, the, we did discuss this one, every ensemble use workshop, okay. I know the, the bandwidth for the web system, you know, always limited, okay. So we designed the many ways. One is to select the, the parameter, don't the, transmit all the, the parameters, okay. Select the priority. That is the one, we already have a list, each, each center's, and the regions, they give, give us this. We still have the table over there one. Second one, we uh, have uh, several discussions when design what is represent uncertainty to instead of the transmit the whole the members. Right now, 21, future maybe 40, 50. The system, you know, resolution increase, that always is, is, is challenging, okay? So after discussion, we agree, I think user, most of them agree, we can consolidate it to general distributions. For example, give you three numbers. One is ensemble mean, another is 10 and 90. So three, member, three members instead of the 21 could be not perfect. They present the PDF, right? Distributions. I mean, in addition, we also produce ensemble 50% and ensemble mode. Ensemble mode and 50% allow you to see the any the you know, skewness or, or bimodality. If you want to use that information, that's additional. I mean, I want to listen to all, you know, gentlemen over here. So what do you think of this one? And how to move this forward? Yeah. That part, that part is much more linked to that question was asked earlier. How do the service centers use this? And, and, and I mean, it's not that hard to figure out, not that hard to figure out 
how big your ensemble should be and how many members you should. That's a relatively straightforward technical that we can deal with. But in order to answer this question for you, Jen, that requires much more input from the field because the field needs to figure out how to use the data first. All right. Last chance. What do we need to add? Or do we need to take something off? Or have we missed something big? Can just one more uh, follow-up to the uh, GFS uh, boundary layer issues in terms of an action item. We have, uh, we're forming an STI team that specifically deals with improving the global model. Jeff, you said what, there's what, two people signed up for that right now? Yeah, there's two people signed up for that team. There's what, 300 signed up for the high res ensemble team, it seems like? Yeah, so every, everyone's looking to join the, the sexy uh, high res ensembles of the future team. But there's a team there that's going to improve the global model, which we know drives so much. So to the SSD chiefs, you know, find your talented people who can help us make that model better. Okay. I, I think Dave Myrick is organizing, or Jeff Craven. For the, for the, uh, the SU um, the, the team? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, there's uh, is Dave here. I guess so. Now there's, there's a website. We we can make that address available in terms of we we input names. Uh, I know it's a very, very complex problem, but I heard from a lot of Sioux and, and even a few does in southern region asking what could be done with regard to QPF and improving the QPF and the HRRR and other fields. Is, is there anything we can reflect on our list here to uh, address that? I haven't had much discussion about it. A lot of discussion anyway about that. We don't do QPF directly, but I think you can go back to the beginnings of the Joint Numerical Weather Prediction Project. And other than trying to come up with pattern forecasting, I think QPF is on the list of requirements every year implicitly. any model upgrades being tested and statistics shown, QPF is there. Degradation in QPF. I please mute their phone. That is noted Thank you. Very, very much. So, at least please, from my perspective, please hang up. You know, whether you're phone. down, I don't know, but it seems like WPC here or Stan? Stan? Do you have a comment? I got it here. I would say that this topic, and yeah, we would welcome through service, through a VLAB, a kind of thing like we talked about the pseudo on, on this particular topic. There, there's a lot more that could be. That actually, we think we're making progress in QPF from. Uh, the her and actually what you saw from Trevor Alcott yesterday is about uh, clearly about having what can even we're looking to do even right now a time lag ensemble for reliable uh, her QPF uh, forecasts here. So we would welcome through whatever, whatever venue I guess you guys think is best uh, to participate in that. That'd be that's a pretty rich topic. It's an area actually we've been talking with the, uh, uh, the water center also uh, because they wish to use the her. They're already using the HER right now for initial testing of warp hydro, so that's a pretty key area. It, uh, I can say that the QPF drives the land surface fields uh, for us. We're trying to use the radar data, surface OBS, and so on to keep that well constrained. Uh, but that uh, in turn drives the PVL, which then drives the convective environment. So that's actually uh, it's a related component to exactly one of the issues that, uh, as you guys know, we've been addressing with the RAP and the HER this time. So it could go, it could go well beyond the RAP and the HER because, because it, it's not a just first 12 hours problem. This is a problem 
as I've, I've heard uh, WPC uh, mention many a times, this is in day three an issue too. So, so agree with everything except for the fact that don't make it just rep and her centric. Okay, we're drawing close to the end of the session. Um, Action item that was mentioned several times. Uh, um, uh, start to uh, go throughout this group to require, to to acquire, and compose a list of uh, how we use the different models, how we use the, what we use them for, the uh, metrics that we need, all that kind of stuff. So similar to what uh, what Stan was saying about uh, whether we do that through a Google Doc or not. But uh, I'll talk with I'll, I'll work with Stan to figure out how to do that, and either I'll take the lead or we do it together. So uh, basically, gather, gather, and then in quotes requirements from from this from within this group, and then um, in terms of the <laughs> recommendations, uh, um, would it be okay to mention that basically this group uh, uh, support most of and all of the UMAC recommendations, or is that too much to say? How many people have read the UMAC? Well, I guess. Well, as, as presented here, right? Okay. Yeah. Is that, there's no, nobody suddenly uh, being shocked awake by that statement, so it looks good. <laughs> and um, <coughs> in terms of in terms of um, of uh, starting to look at how we can set the production speed by looking at specific forecast ranges. Impression from our discussions that people were uh, generally uh, interested in uh, pushing that. Please mute your line and hang up at this time. Thank you. about what needs to be done with the production suite. Do we want to do that right now or do we want to break? Okay, before you run out, I just want to first off thank you all for participating. Uh, secondly, especially thank Andrew for trying to capture all of this. It's that's really valuable and helpful. We'll clean this up and make this available. I don't, will it be kind of an act, after action report for this yeah, meeting? Yeah. Okay, so it'll become a part of that. So thank you all. And uh, as Mike said, we'll be back here at what, 15 after? Yeah, um, well, between 15 and 20 after. And then we'll, we'll go through the. Yeah.